Welcome to our music forum, the seventh of the season. I have some special words to share with you this evening. It is with great sadness that we learned of the death of His Royal Highness Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. Our thoughts are with Her Majesty the Queen and the Royal Family at this time. Ordinarily, we would postpone this evening's event, but owing to short notice and certain considerations, we have decided to proceed. Therefore, with the utmost respect for Prince Philip, we would like to begin this evening with a minute of silence. Thank you. Thank you. Let us now proceed. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome our guest, James Barron. James has a distinguished career as a New York Times reporter and author. A number of years ago, James embarked on a unique series of articles for the New York Times, tracing the evolution of a Steinway piano from wood in the yard to finished product on concert stage. These compelling articles eventually became a book that James wrote. And it's this topic that James is with us tonight via Zoom from New York to discuss with us. Welcome, James. Thank you, Bob. Good to see you. Good to be here. So as we both know, James, and many of us in the audience as well, Steinway has long represented the very best in pianos. They make many different types of pianos and sizes of pianos. But on this occasion, on this music, in this music forum, we'll focus on their biggest, the Model D, their concert grands. Many concert halls around the world have Steinway concert grands as resident pianos. But for a special concert or for a recording session, an artist might want to select a particular instrument. There are places for that. New York Steinway, Steinway in London, Steinway in Hamburg, and many others. So when I select a piano for a special concert or a recording session, what do I look for? To me, a piano's got to be inspirational. Sitting down and playing at this gleaming row of 88 keys, there's got to be some special transformation that the piano enables. So there are a few little tests that I perform. The first thing I do is sort of assess the neutrality of the instrument, as it were, going from the very bottom key, the very bass, low A, all the way to the top C. So I play a scale to make sure that everything is good, that there's a certain quality of sound, a certain resonance. I want to have as much sound as I can to work with, to create sonic sculpture, as it were, a wide palette of sound, but not too much. And I don't want it to be harsh. I want it to be singing. Um, and, and I test for that in certain other ways as well. I'll hold a particular key, say middle A. And that could go on for quite some time. The resonance is there. The piano has a voice and a good voice. It projects. That's what I like. Then I test for certain other things. I test for levels of sound. How can I create a, a, a quality of, of sound 
that allows for singing tone and accompaniment at the same time on the same keyboard. Chopin Nocturne, but that gives an idea. I can, I feel comfortable. The right hand is able to sing, the left hand is able to provide a kind of seamless accompaniment. That's good. But it may not be good enough. Let's reverse the roles and see what happens. Let's put the, the main line, the melodic line, down here in, in the tenor, or maybe even the bass of the instrument, and see what happens. <laughs> comfortable with the left hand. I feel like the line is coming through. I can mitigate the sound with the right, so sometimes have a kind of duet approach and other times accompany up here um, what's happening in a tenor voice. That's good. I'm comfortable. There are a few other things that I'd like to try. Um, I want to make sure that the action, that is everything that happens from the time that you press down a key to the time the sound emanates, which basically is instantaneous, but there, as James will get into it, are many moving parts. I want to make sure that that's responsive. I want to make sure that I can not only play in this somewhat relaxed milieu of nocturnes and a slowish etude, but also something quicker. So um, for that, I might play a little bit of the Rachmaninoff Third Piano Concerto. I would start it off in a very simple, as it does, in a very simple way, and then it becomes considerably more embellished. finding it, I like. It's good. It's quick. It responds well. The action is dependable. It's even all the way through, and um, it's a joy to play. 
In a real-world piano selection, there are one or two other things I would think about. One is, what's the size of the venue? How big is the hall? Is it, is it Carnegie Hall? Does it seat 3,200 people? Or is it more intimate? And I would choose a piano with a quality of sound that's appropriate for um, the size and the acoustics of, 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 the, of the event. If it's a recording session, things are a little bit different because you know, you're relying on microphones and acoustics come into play, but um, they are mitigated in different ways. Uh, and then, of course, in addition to the size of the venue and the acoustics of the venue, what is the repertoire? Am I playing a Mozart piano concerto, or am I playing something like the Tchaikovsky, which I would demonstrate here, but I'm, I know um, that the Zoom microphone would distort, so we'll, I, I won't do that now. Uh, because it's just too big for the qualities of, of, the, of, of our Zoom session. Um, but I would test that in, in real life. But instead, I'll test something else. I'll test um, the beginning of the extraordinary and transcendent um, last movement of the Beethoven final piano sonata, Opus 111. This is an arietta. It's a, a simple melody. It's not simplistic, but simple. And I want to make sure that the qualities of sound are such that I can craft and mold the, the overall sonic sculpture, the overall sonic dimensions in the way that, that I feel comfortable. Once again, I'll stop here, but you can see there, there's a wide registral expanse. The sound is even all the way through. The top line can, can cut through a little bit without being intrusive. The rest, of the, um, the, the rest of the harmonic structure supports all of that. And so, once again, um, this is something I would test. And this piano passed that test with flying colors. Okay, let's get into how these things are actually built. Um, of course, there's the soundboard. James will talk about that. There's the wood. There's the rim. There's wool's lamb that goes into the hammer felt. There's the adjustment of the pedals, which, um, you know, again, if we were live and in person and you could see my feet, we would, we would fool around with. But given the circumstances, they have to all work. They each do something separate and different and complementary to one another. But the main idea, once again, the sound it's got to be inspirational. You've got to sit here and want to play. Um, life's hard, but playing the piano should be not hard. Playing the piano should be a series of special moments. And by having an instrument that allows you the freedom to do that, that's a good thing. All right, James, over to you. Well, what a series of special moments already just with that wonderful tour of the repertoire, Bob, as you were telling us what you look for. Uh, pianists know only the finished product, what you have there in your music room or what you see on the stage. So the question here is, how do we get to that? Now let's start at the very beginning, and that's always a good place to start. The first thing they do when they make a piano is the rim. It's what gives a piano that familiar shape, 17 long strips of wood that have been milled and rimmed and trimmed again. The last time in that machine, each strip is about half as long as a city bus, and they all have to be bent into shape by hand, according to a process that one of the sons in Steinway and Sons figured out in the 19th century. There is a sketch he drew that shows the frame and the clamps that hold the rim in place. They call that the rim bending machine, even though it doesn't have a motor, it's really just a vise, a, a custom made in the shape we all know. 
what's going on here in the Steinway factory is a race against time to build the rim. That the rim bending team has to carry the strips from where they're cut in a room upstairs at the factory and then glue them together downstairs, forming what they call the book. That glue starts to harden immediately. That's why every minute counts. They feed each strip through the, the gluing machine and at the end, they brush on more glue. The foreman told me there's really only one speed and that is fast. There's a lot of pushing and pulling and grunting as they clamp it around that green frame, which is the rim bending machine from the patent diagram. One of the bosses at the factory calls this the Fred Flintstone part of the operation. It's a ritual of the early industrial age that they act out several times a day. They use crowbars to make sure everything is fitting just right. The pressure on the wood is supposed to be even all the way around because the rim has to hold for decades. The rim is one thing they don't rebuild when a piano is 50 or 60 or 100 years old. They can take out the sounding board and the other parts that we'll see as we go along, but the rim is the backbone of the instrument, unchanging and unchangeable. And after one last twist, their job here is done. But just think, from the roaring 20s through World War II and then the Cold War, that wood was probably being tapped for maple syrup. Now it's going to be a piano. Well, they left that brand new rim in the rim press overnight. And then the next morning, they took it out and wheeled it to a room that looks like a wine cellar, except that it's hot and dark instead of cool and dark. It's a temporary home to 500 rims, all awaiting sounding boards and cast iron plates and, and keys. The REM spent March there and all of April and about half of May just sitting there. It was forgetting. That room is where the wood is supposed to forget what it used to be, a tree or, or boards that were long and straight. Wood has a memory and this is reprogramming. It's all about forcing the wood to remember what it is now, two long curves in a straightaway. That piano won't make a sound for months. Those first notes won't be heard until the most experienced workers in a factory with a payroll of 450 have fussed and fumed over it. So while the rim is hidden away there, let's look at some history. The book I wrote is about watching Steinway build one piano from start to finish, as Bob said. So it's really a full length biography of an object, that object, known not by a name, but by the number CD60. But really the biography of one piano is the story of many stories. It's the story of the family that virtually invented the grand piano in America in the 19th century, of brothers and cousins who drank, who went off to fight in the American Civil War, and who dabbled in bulletproof vests and streetcars and amusement parks. It's the story of a few workers who have exceptionally good ears and of many who never read a note of music. It's the story of men who dream of cars and motorcycles while they're doing impossibly precise work, drilling and trimming and sanding and fitting. And it's also a story of that particular place, a place where people are passionate about pianos. That guy said, he once had a dream, his wife turned into a piano, and he's the factory manager. So CD60 continued a tradition going all the way back to number one, which Heinrich Engelhard Steinweg made in the family kitchen in Germany in the 1830s. He's the one before the Amper's Hand in Steinway and Sons. The sons Americanized their names, but not the fathers. Heinrich Engelhard Steinweg was born three years before the 18th century ended in the same year as Schubert. Now, Schubert lived to be only 31. Heinrich Engelhard Steinweg, who beat all the averages for life expectancy in those days, lived past 70 and didn't start making pianos until he was 35. He didn't come to the United States until he was 53. Heinrich Engelhard's early life couldn't have been more different from Schubert's. 
after his mother froze to death, hiding to a, hiding in a cave in war-torn Germany, and later his father was killed by lightning, he joined the army and became a bugler at the Battle of Waterloo, or so the story goes. After mustering out, he built pipe organs. He played them too. He was the organist at his own wedding. And then he tried pianos. Now in the early romantic piano, the piano in production when Steinweg and Schubert were young, the hammers were covered with leather, so it wasn't very loud. They were really the size of Q-tips. That piano was still a, a salon instrument. You could accompany a singer, but an orchestra would drown you out. The piano became the 19th century's home entertainment appliance. They had pianos on the American frontier before they had bathtubs. And in Europe, painters painted what was around the house. So Benoit painted Jeune Fille, Manet painted Madame Manet, and later, if you had talented friends and a newfangled camera, you photographed Debussy with Ernest Chausson as the page turner. You don't know who the photographer was. Now, it was Heinrich Engelhard who presided over the transformation of the piano into something with a, a big voice and a fast action, the kind of mechanism Bob was showing off earlier that could handle trills and repeated 30-second notes. Those were the kinds of improvements that attracted attention once the Steinways migrated from Germany and set up shop in New York. They arrived in 1850 when New York was a piano boom town. Being in the piano business then must have been like being in the software business in the 1990s. Everybody had to have a piano. And piano manufacturers were scrambling to make bigger and bigger pianos for the bigger and bigger concert halls that were going up. For the Steinways, the race ended with the biggest piano they'd ever made, the direct predecessor of the piano we left in the rim conditioning room back there. The basic design came along in the 1880s. That's the diagram for a patent on it. And yet for all the Steinways work, look at this. That's the oldest piano in the world on the left there, made in 1720. Look at what the Steinways started with. Look where they ended up. They didn't put the keys on the side. They didn't put the treble notes where you'd have to play them with your left hand and the bass with your right. They didn't put in some newfangled 19th century invention like a steam engine. They excelled at refinements, at making sure all of those parts added up to an ever greater sum. Their factory in New York City has become a time capsule for manufacturing methods that other industries left behind in the rush to automation. Some of the tools are older than the workers who operate them, and the factory manager describes what they do there as anti-manufacturing. It doesn't mean they go around smashing pianos. He's talking about old-fashioned manufacturing methods that they've stuck with over the years, like letting the rim age in that room for three long months. And actually, that very old photograph is not in backwards. They put the letters on the roof so you could see them from the East River. And if you were a barge captain coming into the load of wood, you wouldn't miss your destination. These days, the wood arrives on tractor trailers to be unloaded in New York City's most prestigious lumber yard. It's a temporary home to millions of dollars worth of wood. Not all of it will end up in pianos. Steinway scraps about half the wood that comes in. A lot of it just falls short of their standards. On close inspection, very close inspection, they discover the grain is too wavy or there are bumpy spots where branches once split off. So the maple for the rim comes from the Eastern United States. But the soundboard is spruce and came, comes from Alaska or Western Canada in the case of CD60 because there's not much usable spruce left in the Northeast. In Vancouver, the harbor is a supermarket of raw lumber, hundreds of logs floating there, lashed together, marked as you can see with um, graffiti style spray paint to indicate which logs belong to which brokers will sell them to mills called remanufacturers, which in turn will sell them to customers like Steinway. 
The rim and the soundboard, they're designed to be big and essentially stable, even when the soundboard is busy vibrating. What causes the vibrations, what happens just above the sounding board, uh, inside the piano, uh, about a foot and a half from your finger, is this tiny jitterbug of parts. Without those parts, the piano wouldn't make a sound unless you strummed it like a guitar. The contraption that we see there is, is the part a pianist can actually feel. It works kind of like a seesaw. When you press the key, things pivot and, and push, and the hammer swings up and strikes the key. All those little parts can be tightened, they can be loosened, they can be twisted and pulled or tweaked and retweaked. All the suit of particular pianist, as Bob said. They make millions of those parts at the factory every year. After all, every piano has to have 88 of them. The finger work in this part of the factory, the hand work is as careful as a pianist's and, and practice and, and memorization figure in what goes on just as they do for pianists. The labor there is exact. They do things like center a little hole, three sixteenths of an inch in diameter, in a piece of wood seven sixteenths of an inch wide. It's very small. In making hammers, they start with a long loaf of felt wrapped around wood that goes through a slicing machine like that one on the left there. It works like a, a guillotine or a slicer in a bakery, creating hammers that can be sanded down or pricked with little needles to open up the surface. The big ones in the base section will have a, an easy life. They'll have to make contact with only one or two strings. Up in the treble, the hammer has a harder job because there are three strings for each node. Now, as CD60 came out of the rim conditioning room and, and worked its way through the factory, it was tuned and, and polished and worked on some more. It was broken in by a machine that plays scales without complaining, unlike a student. CD60 was assigned a plate. Plates are one of the few parts that Steinway doesn't make there at the factory. It turned out that the plate for CD60 was cast at the foundry, several hundred miles away, even before they bent the rim. The plate for CD60 weighed about 150 kilograms, if I did the conversion correctly to metric, and it would fit into every concert grand Steinway has made since the 1880s, but it wouldn't fit perfectly. Every rim is ever so slightly different because every sandwich of wood is ever so slightly different. So every rim gets ground around the edges as the great plate grinder is doing there to, to match the rim of the piano it's going into as precisely as possible. Some of the workers will spend time with this piano, days or weeks, more time than most pianists will spend with it. And to an outsider, what they do looks tedious, if not arcane. This guy, whose nickname is Dragon, although he's not really a fire breather, was responsible for putting in those thick wooden braces that you won't see unless you lie on the floor and crawl into the piano. A worker named Earl Baldwin put in the dampers. They're the little blocks of wood and felt that whose, whose purpose is to prevent the strings from vibrating. The dampers ride on little rods that lift them when the hammer strikes the string and then the hammer goes down again and the damper goes down at the same time. That motion happens en masse when you press the damper pedal, which is the one on the right, it lifts all the dampers at once. But before those essential mechanical parts can go in, there's some cos cosmetic work to be done. CD60 went into a paint booth where that maple rim got the ebony look sprayed on by a worker whose last job before Steinway was to paint cars in an auto body shop. He told me there's less aggravation here. Pianos don't complain the way drivers do. This man performed a marriage on CD60. He married the sounding board to the rim. He has one of the factory's most demanding jobs. He's the belly man. It's a job that figures in Steinway's storied tradition 
William Steinway, the, the son in Steinway and Sons, who was the president for 40 years in the 19th century, worked as a belly man when he was young. Now, this belly man, whose name is Tony Blavin, not only glued the soundboard with help from other workers down the line, he locked it in place with clamps while the glue dried. Some people say the belly man's job got its name because the only way to do it is to lie on your stomach on top of the soundboard with the plate hanging over your head out of the frame there. Uh, that's not really true. The piano industry borrowed the term from violin and guitar makers. And Tony Lavin also, not, also notched the bridge so the strings would have a place to go. You know, on a violin, the strings run up to the bridge and down to the neck. Well, it's almost the same on a piano, up to the bridge and down to the plate. The bridge serves as a, a kind of transducer, transferring the relatively weak vibrations of the string to the soundboard, which functions as the amplifier. Now, this was a tour de force. He carved 88 little notches into the top of the bridge, each at the right spot in the right angle, without measuring. Then he spot checked that everything was right. Let me put it this way. He didn't say anything. He just shot me a look that said, told you so. CD60 went on to a soundproof booth where it was tuned for the very first time. Now the first recognizable melody was kind of a surprise for a piano whose ancestors inspired the slogan, the instrument of the immortals, because it wasn't Bach, it wasn't Beethoven, it wasn't Rachmaninoff, but the opening from the theme of the satirical American cartoon series, The Simpsons. This guy spent even more time with CD60 than the belly man as the tone regulator. This guy, whose name is Bruce Campbell, was the only one who, who was the one who really developed CD60's personality. That meant he turned it into something more than a, a long haul loaded with parts. He spent hours listening to that piano, listening for possibilities, listening to the way it responded to tiny adjustments he made, making more adjustments, then listening some more. He looks like a teenager in a rock band, don't you think? And he, and he once was, but he's one of the factory's most experienced workers, in part because he does know music. But his boss says a tone regulator is almost like a mechanic. The thing is, a mechanic only worries about one engine or, or one transmission or four wheels. Bruce has 88 notes to deal with. He said he learned his job the old fashioned way through what amounted to apprenticeship. That's still the way it's done at Steinway's factory uh, in Hamburg, Germany, but not at the factory in New York. Campbell hung out with the tone regulators when he was a younger man, hung out during their coffee breaks and lunch hours, and he asked a lot of questions. Uh, this was while officially his job was voicing pianos, shaping hammers on uprights and, and on smaller grands. Then he graduated to concert pianos. Along the way, he learned things like the somewhat different art of regulating, which involves tailoring those tiny interacting parts in the action. Their specifications and measurements that are interdependent. If the tone regulator sets the hammer to the wrong height, other things will go wrong. The same goes for the touch, which as Bob said is crucial for the feel of the piano and thus the sound a pianist gets from it. Will the pianist say it's too heavy? Will it feel like you're pushing all the way to the center of the, center of the earth? Or will it be so light you'll think the key's going to sound if you just breathe on it? It all depends on the weight needed to make the key go down. It's supposed to be two grams, I think, about the same as a couple of pennies here in the United States. The hammers were not supposed to spring up when Bruce put that much weight on. A few did on CD60. He made some adjustments to fix them. CD60 was tuned and checked and polished some more, and then it shipped out. Steinway had designated it as part of the concert fleet that Bob mentioned earlier. Those are pianos that Steinway lends out for concerts and, and recitals and recording sessions and TV programs and summer music festivals. Those pianos are supposed to be the best of the best. 
The home for those pianos is in the basement at Steinway in Manhattan, which is a storied place for pianists going back generations. There were usually a dozen grands in there coming and going from concert to concert, and a pianist could stop by to try them and pick out the one that sounded best for his or her next appearance, his or her next appearance. So after all that work, how did CD60 turn out? How good really was it? I got a number of pianists to try it. Stephen Huff said, said it sounded raw when it was brand new. He said it was like a shoe that needed time to be broken in. The Labeck sisters, Katya and Marielle, played the Mother Goose Suite by Ravel. Katya Labeck said CD60 was not terribly brilliant yet, but there was one pianist for whom CD60 sounded as if it had been made. That was Bob Taub, who played a Chopin etude. And I'm not just saying that because he invited me to do this talk. It says so on page 218 of my book. He said the CD60 was effortless to play and predictable, which is what he looks for. So everything you're doing is an artistic statement rather than what he called a mechanical compensation. From there, CD60 was bundled up. It was sent off to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Now it went in the back way, not up the big steps on Fifth Avenue. And it became one of three house pianos at the Met. A pianist playing a, a recital in the auditorium there could try out all three and decide which one to play. The American pianist Andre, Andre Watts chose it, as did Menachem Pressler and Anton Querty, to name only a few. CD60 has been sold to a college in Lower Manhattan since then. But while it was at the Met, that very new piano was about 100 yards from the world's oldest piano, the one we saw earlier. If you were Superman, you could smash through the wall at the back of the stage and fly up to the second floor and breeze over a balcony and through another solid wall, and you'd be there. I'm just a mild-mannered reporter from a major metropolitan newspaper. I took the stairs. And that's the story of the piano in the book, Piano. Thank you very much. Bob, back to you, as they say in television. <laughs> James, thank you. Wonderful elucidation, riveting photos, great narrative, and what an exciting journey that you've shared with us. Thank you, James. Um, as always, to everyone who's, who's tuned in, we do have the opportunity for questions, which we'll address um, a little, in a little while. Uh, and I, so please, um, I think the email, the dedicated email address for those questions is, is displayed. Uh, so please don't be shy. Um, let, let's talk a little bit, James, about some of the wonderful elements of pianos and piano building and, and the whole culture around pianos and Steinway that you've um, brought so vividly to life. Uh, sp specifically, I was thinking a little bit about um, not only the factory, which is in Queens, which was a major, and still is a major, but it used to be an extremely major employer of the area. I mean, there's Steinway Street, there's Steinway bus lines. Um, they, they, it was a company town in, That's right. in kind of the best sense. It's not the Upton Sinclair sense, I don't think, but you know, they, they cared for their workers in, in ways that were very helpful and beneficial to all. Um, in a, in a similar way, the concert basement of Steinway and Sons in, in New York, which you refer to as a story place, is exactly that. Um, they, the Steinway firm has always been extremely generous with um, time and, and materiel to, to their Steinway artists. I remember many times booking time in the evenings to go there and rehearse on um, two pianos, which is difficult when you're living in New York and you have only one small piano, to rehearse for uh, upcoming engagements with piano concertos and, you know, drag along a friend to play the uh, orchestral part reduced for second piano. Um, and I've returned the favor a number of times. And, and, and the, the, those kinds of opportunities are so critical to artists around the world. And the kind of welcome that Steinway offers in that regard and in regards to rehearsal is, I think, you know, universal. Uh, have you, uh, 
a generation before us, there were people who would sleep in that room if they if you could sleep under the piano while somebody else was playing. And so they saw the braces that I mentioned earlier in the slide with the red uh, frame in, in place. Um, but yes, yeah, Steinway has has uh, provided pianos uh, and 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 the atmosphere uh, for pianists for a long time. Um, and and uh, and it's it it's a place that that basement was a place people knew about. It didn't look like much. I mean, it it was cinder block walls, but you knew everybody had been there for a long time. In the uh, around the time I was doing this and and later, the piano the piano that Vladimir Horowitz had used was off to the side, I, and and everybody knew what that piano was. For a while, they sent it out, and you could actually book an hour with that piano. Um, I remember reading articles by people who did so. Uh, but the pianist would come through, sometimes just uh, unannounced. Um, uh, one day while I was there, uh, the pianist Horacio Gutierrez came in. He it was unexpected. Uh, they hadn't really been expecting him, and uh, uh, and this was. Uh, special to me because when I was taking piano lessons, his wife uh, worked for my music teacher and accompanied me doing uh, the Mozart concertos and, and the Mendelssohn uh, uh, piece that I learned. Uh, she played the orchestra part. So it, in a way, it's, it, it's sort of like a, a home, not exactly a home away from home for pianists, but it's a, it's a gathering place for them. Uh, and it contributes to the sense that there's this... Um, uh, Fraternity is the wrong word because there are certainly women uh, pianists who are very much a part of this. But the but the sense of a of a community uh, that exists and that exists around those instruments. There are pianists who, when they are traveling, then they can't take their pianos with them. Uh, exchange notes on how the pianos work in the places they go, and the and and that again gets at what you were talking about about how everyone is different. If you can't pick the one you want, how is it going to be different? And so some of them have notes and trade back and forth, keep notes on file cards or now on, on their um, uh, phones uh, to be able to tell each other, you know, well, well, when I got to someplace, to this place, you know, there was a note that stuck or uh, be careful of the of the low C. It it it's faster than all the others. You if you hit that, it's going to overwhelm the rest of the of the chord or the rest of the passage. Um, so there's a, a it, it it it's a very uh, pleasant place. Uh, it also struck me uh, as you were talking, Rob, about the community that that there's the sense of time both uh, at the factory and in the basement. It's not exactly that time stands still, but it's different in so many other places in New York City. It's not hurry. Uh, and that goes into all of this work. Um, obviously, if you're on if you're about to go on stage and and the string breaks, uh, the tuner has a, a fixed amount of time. But there's an unhurriedness to this, just as there was at the factory baking the piano. They let the the Wood and the components take the time, take the time they need to get what they want. That, that's a really good point. And let's reflect upon that, James, in a slightly different way. Um, the time it takes for a piano to be built is uh, measured in more than, more than one year, fewer than three, probably. Uh, I'm talking about the grand pianos. Um, so, you know, somewhere, I don't know, 18 months, maybe 24 months for a single instrument. So, but if we, if we were to compare that, or, or if we were to project that into the total number of pianos that Steinway has made from number one, which you sh showed us, to number, what, 650,000, something like that today? Up around there somewhere now. 
So in its history from 18, what was it, 18... 1835, maybe, when they really made the first one. Right. Uh, okay. uh, 1853, I think, when they started in the United States. Right. Uh, Bob, you're, the, you're better at math than I can, than I am. I cannot possibly do the math for that amount of time uh, well, in, almost, in almost any dimension. Um, well, but let's just think about it. I mean, that, that number of pianos, 650,000 pianos, and that includes all of them, including the uprights and, that's right. and smaller grands, uh, from the company's inception over 150 years ago. That's, that's a relative, that's a small number. If you compare that to, say, Yamaha, which makes great motorcycles, um, and they also make pianos. Yes. Uh, how, many, how many Yamaha pianos have been made in, that, in the equivalent of Millions. Yes, I mean somewhere in a shorter north of, period of time. Yes, and by the way, um, just to show, I mean Yamaha cares about their pianos, and you might see the insignia, which is three interlocking tuning forks. They also use that on some of their other products, like um, sound reproduction, and and also, uh, as it turns out, motorcycles. But um, uh, it's it's a staggeringly low number of pianos that Steinway has built because of the care um, that they take in each one. I think one of the statistics that you shared with us, um, it, it was a very meaningful one. They discard a very large percentage. Was it 50% of the wood that something, arrived? Something along that, uh, along that range. They look at it, they inspect, and then they, they decide, even though they had a, a, someone whose job title was wood technologist, a fairly senior person in the, in the factory, um, in the uh, in the factory offices, there was what I think I came to call management row up on the second floor. The factory manager was had the corner office at one end. The president of the company had the corner office at the other, and one of the offices in between belonged to the wood technologist. That shows you how important wood is to them as a as a component, and he's the one who took me along to the to Vancouver when I went there into the mills, which I didn't show you here, but we went to uh, to the place where the logs get uh, uh, milled on the way to uh, on the way to the company that sends them to New York. Um, and and so even with all that care and even with the wood technologist riding the mill and riding the, the remanufacturing and uh, as they call it. The, 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 where the uh, trees are, are split and, and sort of rough cut. Riding them, pick the best ones for us because all of those companies have other clients, obviously. Uh, even with him saying, we want the best. And even after, I don't know, a couple of generations, if not longer working with those companies, what comes in once they start sawing into it doesn't always meet their standards. And it's interesting because they put a premium now on very straight grain. In other words, if you look at the soundboard of a piano, they want the grain to be straight as far down as it can go. If you take the soundboard out of a piano that's, that was made say in the 1920s, it wasn't always that way. And they can't explain really why they have uh, why they have decided straight grain works so much better that's just what they want well, that's very interesting you know and it ties into um the first question that has that i've received here uh, how do steinway pianos produce today compared to those of the past and that's a question from brian in northampton so well it's, we, it, let's it, leave, let's you you go first and then i'll have a i'll have a response as well well, there are people who think pianos from the 1920s were the best ones of all. And there were probably, I don't know this, there were probably people in the 20s who thought pianos from a little earlier were the best ones of all. Um, some of it depends on uh, that individuality that, that you were describing earlier. In other words, what's right for each pianist, you know? I could probably say I'm biased because the, the piano in our living room was made in 1927. It was 
chosen by my, um, my wife's grandfather was a, a doctor, a uh, throat doctor to a lot of the opera singers of the day, but one of his other clients was, uh, patients was um, Moritz Rosenthal, the last living pupil of Liszt. When Dr. Ruskin wanted a piano, he called up Moritz Rosenthal, who went down to Steinway and tried some of them out and picked that one. It is a wonderful piano to the point that it, it, it still has all of the original, it's never been um, rebuilt. And I have put off rebuilding it because I don't want to, that, you know, I sort of don't want to mess with it. It, it's, it needs work, but it's still that good. Um, I also have a, a 1915 piano, uh, Steinway, that um, was my music teacher's. Uh, my parents bought it when she retired. It's different, but it's wonderful in a different way. So I'm not trying to hedge, Brian. I, it, it, it's totally individual. Good points. And I, I agree that there are certain qualities about some of the older Steinways that are wonderful and unique. From my perspective, I would say that I've, the, some of the new pianos that I've played recently at the, at the factory for a D selection um, about a year and a half ago were phenomenal. I mean, really, really great uh, and made me feel as if I were just soaring. I was just gliding effortlessly and um, you know, without just being able to completely express everything that I wanted to musically and more. Um, and, and once again, you know, that's how we began this um, discussion about pianos. That, to me, that's what I look for. And um, I, I know that the odds of me encountering an, a really good 1920 Steinway on a concert hall, in a concert hall situation, those odds are very, very small. So I, I want to... Sorry? Well, and it's probably worth making the point that, no, you wouldn't encounter that. This is a, it's a good point. You wouldn't encounter that because a piano in a concert hall takes a beating. In other words, uh, they, they take them back after a, a certain amount of time. Uh, you know, it's like a, a car needing a 100,000 mile checkup, whatever that is in, in kilometers, um, and, and that you need to change uh, parts, uh, replace the hammers because hammers, uh, they're made of, 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 of wool, of felt and, and wood, if they're getting played four or five nights a week, when there's no pandemic, um, they get worn down in the way the hammers on, on our 80 year old, 90 year old piano uh, have gotten worn down over that period of time when it went years of not being played. Um, so yes, you, the pianos you're going to see as, a, as an artist would be probably it would be newer, probably not more than 10 or 12 years old at, at the most. Um, and, and that's an important consideration because if, uh, if people think that modern pianos are not up to it, then what do you do? Yeah, and, and by, by extension, um, I can also say that I, I, Steinway continues to refine um, critical small elements of, of the components, of the technology of the components, yep. the technology of manufacturing. Um, a, few, a number of years ago, they experimented with a fourth pedal to help um, control the decay of, of sound or the way chords, when you're holding a chord, which notes um, sort of die away first. So, um, and they've also experimented with a lid, instead of just the lid at the, on the top of the piano, they've experimented with a lid underneath the pianos or project the sound which comes emanates from the soundboard goes down and reflects off the floor to project that out into the hall or into a large room um, and that was brilliantly effective it looks a little weird but it's very effective um, so they, they're continuing to fool around with things which is great they're they're interested in innovation as well as preserving everything that's good about a truly organic product you know wood lamb's wool for the felt of the hammers Etc. There's another question that's come in. It's kind of related uh, from someone in New Jersey, Samantha in New Jersey. Is there a particular Steinway concert piano that you like? Um, well, James, you've talked about. Uh, well, have, do you? I can answer that very easily. But I think this. I think Bob, this is for you. Okay. 
Um, there was a time when uh, there was a particular piano in New York that I requested a lot, CD-237. CD-237 was my dear friend. Um, it, I, I played it in Lincoln Center a number of times. I recorded it on it. It always felt like um, a familiar instrument um, whenever I came back to it, and I loved it. Um, unfortunately, in those days, when I was really starting my career, I was eating a lot of rice and beans, and when it was time to for CD-237 to go into private hands, there was no way I could afford it. Um, uh, I still eat rice and beans, but um, if, if it were available today, I might think about it, but um, I'm sure it's living a good life out in the piano, piano, piano pasture somewhere, but it was you a know, magnificent instrument. You know, that story reminds me of when the book came out, I did an appearance where I was going to accompany a singer and, and Steinway very kindly send a piano. Uh, the, the appearance was in a place with a Steinway from the 19th century. It was in the, uh, on the estate, now a, a museum of, of a railroad baron. Uh, but they couldn't have the uh, appearance in our little concert on that piano in that room. So there was another piano, another room, and they sent a piano. And that piano, uh, the number of which I've forgotten, was like that for me, like your CD-237. It was the one that if I could have kept it, I would have just send that one home, you know, hijack the truck and, and send it on home. It was, it was wonderful. And it turned out it had been on Broadway for a while. Um, I believe there was a play, I may misquote the title, but I believe it was uh, 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 32 variations on a theme by um, Diabelli. In other words, it was about, it was a takeoff on, on the Beethoven title. Right. Um, and, and they had intended to, uh, and they had intended to have a, a Model D like CD60 down on the, uh, I guess on the left in front of the stage. And it was, it wouldn't fit. And so they went to this piano, which was a Model B slightly shorter and used that for however many performances in the run, and then, as they do, put it back in the concert fleet. Right. Well, as I say, if it were up to me, I'd have just hijacked that truck, yeah. take it onto the apartment. It was my CD-237 equivalent. I can understand that, that feeling, that, that very strong feeling. There's one last question which we'll take. Um, it's from Julie in Exeter, and it's an interesting question. What do you think of the Spirio? So let's explain what the Spirio is. Um, the Spirio is um, Steinway's modern day player piano, um, in summary. Um, it uses advanced software and technology to replicate prior performances that have been recorded so that um, you can, with a Spirio equipped piano or a Spirio instrument, you can hear someone else playing a particular piece the way you could hear piano rolls or other things uh, of that nature uh, prior to the advent of gramophone records um, or even during the time of the early gramophone records with uh, long playing records uh, and as well as wax cylinders. So um, I've tried a Spirio. I haven't recorded anything for Spirio, but I've, I've played around with it a little bit. Um, and Yamaha has a has an, a sort of equivalent to disc club here, which is quite popular as well. Um, as a utility, I think it's extremely interesting and very very good. One of the elements that we spoke about a tiny bit earlier was the element of choosing a piano for the acoustical setting, or by extension of that thought, mod modifying one's playing based on the acoustics that you're facing at the time of performance. You know, one of the most critical things for pianists, or any, anyone making music really, is to hear yourselves as others hear you, as Robbie Burns might say through, the, through a mixed metaphor. Um, so you take one ear and you put it out in, into the audience and, and you try to understand what the audience is really hearing. And if it's not what you want to be projecting, you make those infinitesimally quick adjustments. You can do that with a, with a piano, with a good responsive piano, but obviously when a recording is made, 
that's it, you're done. You can't make those adjustments um, it, with a spirio or a disc clavier or anything that's been uh, immortalized in, in, this, in the same way. So I think it has its place, um, and I think it can open up performances in many ways. It's kind of cool and almost um, ghost-like to see the keys go down and no one's sitting there. Uh, makes me vaguely uncomfortable. Reminds me of an old film called Shoot the Piano Player. Um, but uh, I, I think, personally, um, I, I like to be in on the action. The, the keys going down like that would be the same with the piano that, uh, uh, that took piano rolls, and they made a lot of those, not only Steinway, but lots of manufacturers in the, in the 1920s. Um, I think the, the thing that uh, they especially promised with uh, Spirio was the accuracy of touch. Uh, obviously, my living room, if I had a, piano, a Spirio piano, is not going to sound like whatever their studio is where the uh, pianists go and record and make those recordings. So everything you said about uh, reading the room, as I would call it, um, uh, it wouldn't be the same in, in, if you were playing in, in my living room as you were playing in that presumably soundproof place. But the touch is going to be the same um, and and uh, and so in a way it's it's interesting. It's interesting to listen to. I agree, and and I think that the Spirio software is extraordinary. The touch reproduction is extremely yeah. good. Even the the ways that um, pedals uses of pedals are reproduced are those ways are also very very good. That's one of the toughest and most subtle elements of piano playing because you're constantly, almost intuitively and subliminally adjusting the pedal, particularly the right pedal, the damper pedal. Um, as you're playing with acoustical conditions, with tempo, with other elements of that third ear, that ear out in the audience um, that's telling you what to do. Um, and and to, to recapture those through Spirio is, is quite a feat. And look at also just... That's pun intended, by the way. Yes, yes. Uh, look, I was, I was going to take the high road, Bob, uncharacteristically. I was taking the high road and was going to say... Um, uh, that um, look at how difficult it is mechanically to do that because the pedals, I mean, certainly there's a place in the body of the piano where the pedal connects to and you can take the measurements and make it work from there, but, but they are all over the place. So it's not as easy as just having everything in a small little box that you can uh, take measurements on and reproduce. That's very true. That's very true. Well, listen, James, this has been, we could go on and, um, and sometime over, you know, a, a, a glass of beer, we probably should. Uh, too bad there's no Steinway beer, but um, we, we should continue this conversation. But for this evening, thank you, James, very, very much for all your fantastic insights and, and um, everything that you've brought to to this music forum and to all of our um, all of, all of our audience and to the audience, thank you for being with us. This is a strange and and um, extraordinary day, but we appreciate the fact that you spent a little time with us this evening. So thank you, and um, thank you, Bob, and thank you, everyone. And so um, this is the final music forum for this season. Um, the Arts Institute has quite a number of events. Um, planned for next season, uh, in addition to the performances of Some Call at Home that are coming up in June at Theatre Royal Plymouth. We have a Beethoven festival at the end of uh, September, early October, to um, commemorate his 250th anniversary of, of the birth of Beethoven. So we hope to see all of you again very soon. Thank you again. <laughs>